Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. We'll start with a new text today having just finished Virginia Woolf's Solid Objects. Uh, so this text, the story we'll start off with today is a story by Sadat Hassan Manto called Toba Take Singh. Now originally the story was written in Urdu but obviously we'll read this in English translation, uh, Toba Take Singh by Sadat Hassan Manto. Now uh, just a little uh, context I think uh, is in order before we start with the main story. This is essentially a story about partition, uh, 1947 partition. And uh, obviously we are all aware of the history of partition, the violence of partition, the trauma of partition. Uh, and it was one of the bloodiest events in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia and perhaps uh, across the world in human history. And now the entire uh, irrationality of partition was obviously that people suddenly became divided because of religious uh, differences. So suddenly they were told that uh, just because you belong to a certain religion, you are supposed to be in a certain place and vice versa. Now, what that did essentially and historically is that it completely complicated uh, people's sense of their own location uh, or people's existential location or emotional location. Like for instance, if someone is told, for instance, uh, that a village that he grew up in and you know, the entire, his entire generations grew up in, his forefathers, him and his subsequent generations would grow up as well. Suddenly the village happens to be in a different country altogether. So that geopolitical shift the sense of geopolitical shift, the, the newness, the abruptness, the accident, uh, the catastrophe of the geopolitical shift, uh, of the geopolitical shift of knowledge narrative, that obviously had lots of emotional and existential uh, replications. Uh, you know, because people suddenly were uh, told, uh, jolted out of their sense of their geopolitical slash existential uh, you know, situatedness. Right. So, for instance, uh, if someone comes and tells a person that the village or town or city that he or she had grown up in is suddenly called something else and is suddenly part of a new country, that would obviously create a sense of uh, jolt, a sense of uh, epistemic violence. And by epistemic violence, I obviously mean uh, violence at a level of knowledge that, you know, at the level of knowledge, what you know is suddenly and dramatically uh, defamiliarized, is suddenly and dramatically, uh, you know, denaturalized and made into something else. And that obviously uh, generates a sense of epistemic violence, the violence at a level of knowledge. So your sense of uh, knowledge, your, your knowledge of your surroundings, your knowledge of reality, your knowledge of who you are, where you belong, everything just changes dramatically and, and a quite in, in a cataclysmic kind of a way. Now obviously with partition the change was very dramatic, the change was very violent, very bloody. Uh, people were killed, slaughtered, um, you know, mutilated. And obviously the mutilation, the bodily mutilation, and all of us are aware of this very iconic graphic images of uh, the partition where trains full of human corpses would be sent across the borders from either side. So they'd be trained from you know, India to Pakistan, Pakistan to India, full of corpses, which would be indicative of the degree of slaughter, the degree of violence which took place. Uh, it's obviously a shameful uh, part of human history, it's a, it's a disgrace in human history uh, and it's one of the fallouts of imperialism. I mean this is what some of the last things that imperialism did to this part of the world. It just created this divide from which we are yet to recover. Now given that this is the context in the story, this particular story is not exactly about physical violence, right? So it is actually uh, it goes more sinister than physical violence. It becomes more sinister, darker. Uh, it has a dark comic quality to it, which actually makes it even more disturbing. The fact that you can actually produce comedy out of such a situation, a uh, situation of loss, alienation, existential um, uh, annihilation. How can that be turned into a comedy? How can that be turned into something which uh, almost makes you laugh, right? And the laughter which comes out of this uh, uh, story sometimes is obviously laughter which is subversive in quality. A laughter which is sort of mocking in quality. It's a sarcastic, dry laughter. It's not a laughter of fulfillment, it's a laughter of the knowledge of nothingness, which is what the laughter is about in the story. Now, interestingly, this story is set in a madhouse, an asylum, and the setting, the temporal setting in the story is a few years after partition. So it's a post-partition story set in a madhouse. So the time and the place in the story are very important. Now the madhouse obviously is a very symbolic place, a symbolic space rather 
for irrationality. Right? That's why irrational men and women stay, quote unquote, irrational men and women stay. But also and equally, the madhouse is also the space where the medical and the political converge, uh, sometimes very brutally, sometimes very, very strategically, and sometimes very, very non humanly, uh, in order to treat human beings, in order to correct human beings, to cure them. So there is always this, uh, apart from a curative quality, apart from this uh, caregiving quality, there's also this coercive quality about the madhouse. Uh, there is a degree of violence uh, about the madhouse with which people are you know, constrained, people are sort of forced to stay there, uh, physically confined to certain spaces, to certain parameters, certain permitted parameters. And the whole idea of the permitted parameter in the madhouse, people are supposed to wear a certain color dress, dress straight jacket more often than out. Uh, people are sort of medicalized, madness is medicalized. So that obviously becomes a uh, uh, very uh, two-pronged instrument of medicalization and legalization because on the one hand you classify someone as mad uh, through a medical process. Now in this story you find that madness becomes a very complex category, uh, especially in the wake of partition, especially in the wake of this massive massacre of partition, the violence of partition. Because what it does, that backdrop, that partition backdrop, is that it completely inverts the rational-irrational uh, dichotomy or the rational-irrational uh, relationship. Right, because you know what appears to be irrational is sometimes in this story uh, it, it seems to be the most rational decision, the most rational question, uh, the seemingly irrational question. Whereas the bureaucracy outside the madhouse, which is that of the rational universe, that sometimes uh, stems from the most irrational, uh, evil maneuver against human beings. Right. So among other things, this story inverts this rationality, irrationality question, the mad normal question, etc. And it asks a very fundamental question about life, for instance, how does one's understanding of one's existential self and the situatedness of the existential self, how does that change uh, when a major geopolitical change occurs, when a major political change occurs, when a major discursive change occurs. And throughout the story, we found that, you know, we've read novels such as Ulysses, we've read Mrs. Jalloway, we read Eliot's early poetry, almost everything that we've read so far, we find that there's this very interesting connection between discursivity and experientiality. Right? So what is discursive out there? The set of laws, the set of narratives, the coded quality of narratives, etc., all that architecture around us. How that affects us experientially. Uh, so for instance, a very good parallel but with this story would be Mrs. Jalloway, something which you've already done in this course. So Septimus Smith, for instance, the way he's treated uh, is obviously very, very coercive in quality rather than caregiving quality. The, the doctors in that story, the, the novel, Holmes and Bradshaw, they, they, they appear as absolutely totalitarian uh, you know, figures uh, representing a certain regime of care, a regime of cure, which is more coercive rather than caregiving. And you know, the entire medical vocabulary, the entire medical narrative in that story is one of violence, of violence done to the human body. Right? So there's this homosexual quality about that story as well. The same homosexual quality is there in this particular uh, short story, that the fact that these madmen uh, are people who like almost collateral damages. They are sacred but at the same time you know, it's easy to murder them uh, by not killing them. Right? So the whole idea of the liquidated self, the exhausted self is there, the interrupted self is very much there. So madness in the story could be seen as a, as a state of interruption, as, a, as an interrupted state of being, as an interrupted embodiment where normal neural behavior, a normal cognitive behavior is interrupted. Now, interestingly, what happens in this story is that the interruption, uh, uh, the cognitive, normal, neural interaction, uh, interruption in these madmen, that actually becomes subversive in, uh, in quality, subversive in quality. So this, the subversion interruption equation is interesting over here. Right, so the subversive quality about madness is something which we see. It doesn't really decimate anything, it doesn't really invert anything, it doesn't really change anything politically in the real world, but it asks some really fundamental and difficult questions, questions which are directed against some of the uh, so-called rational maneuvers made during partition. Right, so we, on the one hand we have this rational and bureaucratic regime outside which are taking all those big decisions, which are dealing with all those you know, problems of vast quantities of masses of people uh, and obviously making absurd laws. Uh, the absurdity of the real world out there, uh, it's, very, it's sort of critiqued in a very, very sarcastic way by the seemingly absurd behavior, the seemingly absurd activities inside the asylum. Now it turns out in the end that the asylum is less absurd than the world out there. So then again, the absurdity, uh, normalcy logic is inverted and that becomes a problem here in the story as well. Now, 
among other things, this story is also about memory, right? So the whole idea of memory becomes important. What you remember uh, and what you don't remember becomes important because, you know, this, the protagonist in the story is someone called Bishan Singh, who becomes Toba Teik Singh, who's the name of a village which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the non-existence of the village becomes important. It's an absent space, but we'll come to that later. But we find that how uh, the, the protagonist, he, he, has, he suffers from memory loss. Now, technically, uh, the term for memory loss in this particular story, the way it is represented in this story, is a retrograde amnesia. Now, with retrograde amnesia, what happens is you, you retain the memory of something which happened to you many years ago, when you were a child, perhaps. You retain that memory, but you lose a memory of events and figures uh, or experiences which happened to you like not so long ago. So the quicker, the shorter memory that goes away, the longer memory that stays back. And I'm happy, I've, I've got a published article on this particular short story which I'm happy to upload uh, in the uh, forum uh, on request. So do go through it along with the story and find that there's some resonances you may draw in terms of looking at this story from memory studies perspective. So memory obviously is an act of remembering, a re hyphen membrane. There's an organic quality about memory. Now what happens in the story is this, uh, what is to be remembered, or what ought to be remembered, that disappears entirely. So the village called Toba Teik Singh, from which this character is from, Bishan Singh is from Toba Teik Singh, that village goes, goes missing. No one knows where the village is. It's not really a classified space anymore because, you know, that entire idea, the entire ontology, the entire mapping of space has changed dramatically with partition. It's been a very is an act of very violent and very quick remapping with which suddenly these two countries are formed and the old villages which you know, were supposedly belonging to one part of the, you know, one part of this entire landmass suddenly doesn't have any uh, location and it's locationlessness of the village. The fact that Toba Teik Singh is a village and no one knows what, quite where it is. The locationlessness uh, is interestingly mapped onto the agencylessness of the individual. The individual human subject he has zero agency. Decisions are taken for him and he's just supposed to follow the decisions. And the agency lessness and the location lessness, they become uh, uh, interesting uh, competitive categories. Again, which brings me back to uh, something I've talked about already, the whole idea of existential dislocation uh, and followed by or equated with geopolitical dislocation, right? So geopolitics becomes important, politics and geography. Your, your, your sense of shape, your sense of space, your sense of location, your sense of address uh, are politically determined so, and, and decided for you, right? So this is the backdrop of the story, you know, where uh, this entire mad house is located and the madmen, the exchange, you know, so very absurd conversations with each other, which sometimes make more sense than the rational conversations outside because the entire world away is very, very absurd. So in that world, uh, micro-absurdity inside an asylum, uh, it actually makes more sense than the massive absurdity which disguises as rational enterprise in the world out there. So this is the backdrop of the story and uh, we'll just dive into the story right now and we'll see how it goes. So this is Toba Teik Singh by Siddharth Hassan Manto and this should be on your screen. Uh, two or three years after the partition, the government of Pakistan, the governments of Pakistan and India decided to, to exchange lunatics in the same way as they had exchanged civilian prisoners. In other words, Muslim lunatics uh, in Indian uh, madhouses would be sent to Pakistan and Hindu and Sikh lunatics in Pakistani madhouses would be handed over to India. I can't say whether this decision made sense or not. In any event, a date with the lunatic exchange was fixed after high-level conferences with both sides of the border. All the de details were carefully worked out on the Indian side and Muslim lunatics with relatives in India would be allowed to stay. Uh, the remainder would be sent to the frontier. Here in Pakistan, nearly all the Hindus and Sikhs were gone, so the question of retaining non-Hindu lunatics did not arise. All the Hindus and Sikh lunatics would be sent to the frontier in police custody. Now, uh, note the dry, uh, almost detached journalistic tone in the opening of the story. It, it's just giving you information, just giving you data, uh, you know, supposedly in a very dry voice, supposedly in a very objective voice. Now, obviously, this objectivity, the dryness, is uh, it's a very uh, superficial kind of a construct because if we just go deep into it, we find this is not dry at all, this is not, a, you know, a journalistic at all. What has been told to us is that a very sinister thing is happening, a very perverse thing is happening. Suddenly it's decided uh, through bureaucratic meetings that, you know, the entire, even the madmen should be exchanged as far as religious uh, affiliations, as far as religious differences go. So the Muslim madman would go to Pakistan uh, if they don't have a relatives in India, whereas the Hindu madman in Pakistan would be sent back to India. So again, why leave the madmen outside as well? 
So the madhouse over here becomes a very discursive space, as you can say already, right? Uh, well, there's a single person narrative over here, a first person narrative. I can't say whether this decision makes sense or not. So there's this ambivalence, a seeming ambivalence about this decision, which obviously makes a mockery of it. It actually makes it even more sarcastic, the fact that it's obliquely sarcastic, the fact that it's actually not committed uh, to committing uh, or commenting on the decision's viability or usability, right? So that non-committal quality is very journalistic, it's just reporting to you, it's not his job to comment on it. But at the same time, uh, the superficiality of the voice is very, very obvious, uh, as a result of which we actually get to uh, get a flavor of the sinister quality of the entire enterprise. Okay, so uh, I don't know what happened over there. When news of the lunatic exchange reached the madhouse here in Lahore, however, it became an absorbing topic of discussion among the inmates. So again, we now know that the uh, setting of the story is Lahore. Uh, uh, and obviously Lahore, as we know, was one of the most multicultural and cosmopolitan cities in the entire Southeast Asia. And for a long time, uh, people did not know whether Lahore would go to India or Pakistan. There was a big chance it would come to India, because India was a larger landmass and it wanted a piece of Lahore. But in the end, it went back to Pakistan. It stayed, I don't know, it just was associated with Pakistan geopolitically, right? Okay. So this is a madhouse in Lahore, and the inmates are very, very excited on being told that they would just go back to their own countries, uh, depending on what the religious uh, affiliation is. So, for instance, if there is a Hindu madman in a Lahore asylum, that person will be sent back to India. Uh, and if there is a Muslim madman across the border in India, it will be checked whether he or she has any relatives in India. If not, they will be sent back to Pakistan as well. Okay, so it was an absorbing topic of discussion among the inmates. There was one Muslim lunatic who had read the newspaper Zaminda every day for, uh, for 12 years. One of his friends asked him, uh, Mauli Sahib, what is Pakistan? After careful thought, he replied, it's a place in India where they make razors. Right? So again, look at the absurdity uh, in this entire dialogue. But then the whole point is the absurdity is very, very small, very minimal compared to the entire massive spectacle of absurdity, which was a partition in the first place, the violence which was generated out of the absurdity. That becomes the real absurdity in the story. Whereas these micro uh, models of absurdity are very, very innocuous and they don't really mean anything. So uh, there was this person who asked uh, Molubi Sahib, where, in the, where, where Pakistan is, and he thought it's a place in India where people make razors. So again, a very irrational, often Alice in Wonderland kind of uh, response. When bathing, uh, uh, sorry, where they make razors, uh, hearing this, his friend was content. Uh, one Sikh lunatic asks another Sikh, Sadaji, why are they sending us in India? We don't even speak the language. I understand the Indian language. The others replied, smiling. Indians are devilish people who strut out haughtily, he added. While bathing, a Muslim lunatic shouted long live Pakistan with such vigor that it slipped on the floor and knocked himself out. So again, these are the comic touches in the story and we see already that, you know, how Manto is really making it ambivalent for us because on one hand, uh, this is obviously a story about madmen and the complete lack of agency, the complete loss of agency. They're just told to go to some places and they just follow orders. So there is that depressing human coercive condition. But on the other hand, there is a sense of very, very dark humor uh, associated with this entire bu bureaucratic irrationality. So, you know, people are saying India is a, Pakistan is a place where they make razors, etc. And then there's two Sadats, uh, two Sikhs who are talking to each other. Uh, obviously, they are they're supposed to go to India, but they resent the idea of going to India because one of them is saying, well, I don't understand the language at all. Now, obviously, what that tells you is a language uh, like culture, like religion, like uh, almost everything else which defines you as a person is very, very located in terms of where you are. So language and location are very interrelated categories. So, you know, when you use certain language, you also betray your location. Now, what these two sadars who are like technically they should just go to India, but they, they are fearing, they're resenting the very possibility, the prospect of going to India because they don't speak that language, one of them is the other person. And they are much more comfortable linguistically stay here in Pakistan, in Lahore. Uh, although technically they are religiously the outsiders over here, the religious others over here. So we can see how religion, which became the dominant narrative of partition, the dominant narrative of division, is such an inadequate and irrational category because there's so many other categories which are completely sidelined. Location, language, uh, you know, food for instance, uh, and all these different categories which actually inform your cultural identity. They got completely sidelined and religious identity was a dominant narrative which decided and overdetermined the entire brutality and irrationality and absurdity of partition. Okay. 
Uh, and then we're told while bathing, a Muslim lunatic shouted, Long live Pakistan, with such vigor that it slipped on the floor and knocked himself out. So again, all these little comic touches, perversely comic touches, uh, make the story even more sort of ambivalent and sinister in quality. There were also some lunatics who, went, who were not really crazy. Uh, most of the inmates were murderous. Uh, most of these inmates were murderers whose families had bribed the madhouse officials to have them committed in order to save them from the hangman's news. So again, uh, look at the complication or the complicated or the complex demography inside the madhouse because we are told quite categorically that not all of these people who were in the madhouse are mad really. Some of them were actually criminals, some of them are murderers, but just to save them from, the, uh, from hanging, they are classified as mad. Uh, and the families have bribed uh, medical officials to get them in this asylum just so they can be classified as mad. And that classification, that medical classification, would be a safeguard against um, uh, hanging, for instance. Okay. Uh, these inmates understood something of why India had been divided, and they had heard of Pakistan, but they weren't all uh, well informed. The newspapers didn't tell them a great deal, and the literate, illiterate guards uh, who looked after them weren't much help uh, either. All they knew was that there was a man named Muhammad Ali uh, Zinnah, whose people, whom people call uh, Qaidi Asim. He had made a separate country from the Muslims called Pakistan. They had no idea where it was or where its boundaries might be. This is why all the lunatics who hadn't entirely lost their senses were perplexed as to whether they, uh, they, were, Pakistan's, uh, they were in Pakistan and India or were they in India. Uh, then where was Pakistan? Uh, if they were in Pakistan, then how was it that this place where they lived until recently had been known as India? So again, all these are very so crazy questions, but despite the craziness, you know, despite the irrationality, these are very, very fundamental questions that are being asked over here, right? So, you know, if this is India, then where is Pakistan? If this is Pakistan, how come this was India like just a couple of days ago, right? So all these very pointed, irrational questions actually crack up the entire construct of uh, nationalism and citizenship, which are formed at this point of time, historically. Okay, so one lunatic got so involved in this India-Pakistan question that he became even crazier. One day he climbed a, high, uh, climbed a tree and sat on one of his branches for two hours, lecturing without pause on the complex issues of partitions. Again, very irrational, very mad. Someone climbing up a tree and then from there he's almost delivering a lecture to an audience about the complex issues of partition. Now that image of this madhouse climbing a tree, uh, preaching about partition, becomes a very irrational image. But at the same time, uh, this is also a commentary on the irrationality of partition in the first place. Why do we have a partition on this scale, slaughtering so many people, killing so many people purely because of religious reasons? So that is the most irrational uh, you know, thing, the most sinister thing. Okay, uh, one lunatic got so involved and it's India-Pakistan debate that it became even crazier. So, you know, and we are told that, you know, uh, someone climbs a tree and sits in one of the branches for two hours, lecturing without pause on a complex issue of partition. When the guards told him to come down, he climbed higher. When they tried to frighten him with the threats, he replied, I will live neither in India nor in Pakistan. I live in this tree right here. And again, this is a very important uh, beginning of the story where this, this whole sense of space becomes important sense apropos of place. So we have classified places, but then these people are more interested in spaces because spaces is where uh, you psychologically, emotionally, and existentially lie. You're situated in those spaces. Now, here we have a madman who climbs a tree and refuses to come down from the tree. And when the guards chase him up, he climbs even higher and say, I'll go to neither India nor Pakistan. I will sit here on the stream. Now, the reason why this passage is important is that it also brings in uh, the very complex question of agency, right? So the whole idea of agency, the, your will to articulate what you feel with the possibility of making a change. The change may or may not come, but at least you have the freedom uh, to articulate your will, to articulate what you feel. Now, here, uh, the madman, you know, he climbs a tree and sits on the tree and says, this is what my place is. I should just stay forever. I should not neither come down nor go to India or Pakistan. Now, a very quick word on the entire ontology of madness, because because these people are mad, quote unquote, ma medically mad, uh, they are outside uh, the entire uh, panel code, uh, so to speak. And then, thus, we see two men, two or three men, who are actually criminals who, who should be subjected to the panel code. They are actually disguising as madmen, because you know, madness also, also, among other things, a protection uh, from panel code. So it's a madman who commits a crime, a madman who commits an act of violence. The he or she is sort of reprimanded and given a different kind of. Uh, 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 punishment rather than a more civilian uh, punishment, which is more perhaps uh, brutal in quality, right? So there's this person who climbs a tree and sits on a tree and decides not to come down and say, I'm going to live here forever. 
and neither one going to India, nor go to Pakistan. And you know that idea, that choice of not going to either, that is unavailable to all these people. So you either have to go to India or Pakistan. And even that, you don't have a choice because if you belong to a certain religious identity, you are predestined to go to a certain place and vice versa. But see, we can't really complicate it. We can't really say, I'm. I belong to religion X and I will stay in, in, in country Y. No, if you're in religion X, you have to go to religion uh, country X and vice versa. So that, that uh, predestined quality is what, is what makes it so agency-less. And the only way agency can be claimed or articulated is through acts of madness. So over here, interestingly, madness becomes an instrument of agency, an instrument of acquiring agency, of articulating agency. And that is something which we have to keep in mind very, very carefully. Uh, with much difficulty, they eventually coaxed him down. When he reached the ground, he wept and embraced his Hindu and Sikh friends, uh, distraught at the idea that they would leave him and go to India. So again, look at this emotional bond between this madman. Obviously, uh, these are crazy behaviors. But at the same time, beneath the craziness, despite the irrationality, they, the madmen, they end up displaying more human quality rather than the non-mad people. The non-mad people, the bureaucrats out there uh, making all the big decisions, they are the ones who come up with all this series of irrational decisions. And the seemingly irrational madmen in the, in the, inside the madhouse, they reflect or they betray a more humane response uh, apropos of each other. They all hug each other and weep at the prospect of leaving each other. Right. Okay. Uh, one man ha held an MS degree and had been a radio engineer. He kept apart from all the other inmates and spent all his time walking silently up and down a particular footpath in the garden. After hearing about the exchange, however, he turned on his clothes and ran. He turned in his clothes and ran naked all over the ground. So again, the whole idea of stripping and running naked is a, a very classical trope of madness, a very classical, uh, iconic image of madness, uh, you know, taking off your clothes and running. Now we also get to know that he, he was an MS degree holder, a Master of Science, uh, and he's also been a radio engineer. So the radio becomes an important category over here uh, because, you know, as we know, that historically, the entire idea of partition, uh, the entire idea of independence, uh, the entire announcement of independence, partition, all the major political decisions and articulations were done to the radio. So the fact the radio engineer is mad is obviously a symbolic uh, you know, uh, presence in this madhouse. There was one fat Muslim lunatic from uh, Chenehot who had been an enthusiastic uh, Muslim League activist. The Muslim League, as you know, was a major political party which was uh, obviously directed against imperialism and, you know, uh, it, it just supported uh, the entire nationalist movement, uh, freedom movement. He used to wash 15 or 16 times a day, but abandoned the habit overnight. His name was Muhammad Ali. One day he announced that he was quite the Azam, Muhammad Ali Zina. Seeing this, a Sikh lunatic declared himself to be Master Tara Singh. Blood would have flowed, except that both were reclassified as dangerous lunatics and confined to separate quarters. So again, look at the uh, irrational uh, affiliations. The Muslim person is claiming to be Muhammad Ali Zina in his schizophrenic mind. Seeing that, a Sikh lunatic, he calls himself uh, Master Tara Singh, another big spiritual leader, spiritual slash political leader for the Sikhs. So, you know, we have this constant uh, claim uh, to certain figures, uh, which obviously make, uh, you know, which is invested with cultural investments, with cultural affiliations, with cultural prestige, for instance. So one madman uh, imagines it as more than a zina, the other madman imagines it as Master Tara Singh, and they almost come to loggerheads with each other, except for the guards uh, who stop them. There's also a young Hindu lawyer from Lahore who had g gone mad over an unhappy love affair. He was distressed to hear that Amritsar was now in India because his beloved was a Hindu girl from the city. Although she had rejected him, he would not have forgotten her after losing his mind. For this reason, he cursed the Muslim leaders who had split India into two parts so that his beloved remained Indian while he became Pakistani. Now again, we have a Hindu uh, lawyer from Lahore uh, you know, who is now distressed because Amritsar is in India. Uh, you know, because he loved a girl from the city, obviously what he doesn't know, and there's a dramatic irony of it, that Amritsar will go to India eventually, uh, you know, and then, you know, this whole distress will be even compounded, uh, because, you know, uh, he will not be able to travel, uh, and, and again, this whole ban of traveling becomes interesting, because what used to be a free flow, uh, free flowing access to different spaces suddenly is banned by different political uh, permissions, and all that permission becomes quite discursive in quality. Although she had rejected him, uh, he had not forgotten the, her after losing his mind. 
For this reason, he cursed the Muslim leaders who had split India into both parts, uh, the two parts, so that his beloved uh, uh, remain an Indian, while he became a Pakistani. Now, obviously, the dramatic irony here is he doesn't know that he was sent to India as well because he's a Hindu lawyer from Lahore. And, you know, because he doesn't have any, presumably he doesn't have any relatives, and even if he did have relatives, it was decided that, you know, the Hindus were sent from Pakistan to India. So he was going to come to Amritsar as well. When news of the exchange reached the madhouse, several lunatics tried to comfort the lawyer by telling him that he would be sent to India when his beloved left, but he didn't want to leave Lahore, fearing his practice would not thrive in Amritsar. So again, look at this is a comic quality over here, where he's sort of thinking about his practice at the same time. He's saying, okay, I can't go to Lahore, I can't go to Amritsar because my entire practice is over here. So my beloved is in Amritsar, but I can't go because I have to make money, etc. So all these little uh, obsessions with money and petty problems, uh, they play out against the bigger backdrop of the partition, the irrationality of partition, the violence of partition, the epistemy of violence of partition, the epistemy being the level of knowledge. So the knowledge narrative is getting uh, violated, is getting defamiliarized, and therein lies the partition, uh, therein lies the violence. Right. And now we come to the other comic quality over here. In the European world, there were two Anglo Indian lunatics. So we have different kinds of racial and cultural categories over here. Uh, in the European world, there were two Anglo Indian lunatics. They were very, very worried to hear that the English had left after granting independence to India. It, in hushed tones, they spent hours discussing how this would affect the situation in the madhouse. Would the European world remain or would it disappear? Would they, would they be served English breakfast? What would be the force to eat? Uh, what would they be forced to eat? Poisonous body, uh, bloody, bloody Indian chapatis and sort of bread. So again, look at the anxiety, look at the concerns over here by these two Anglo Indian lunatics. And you know, the first thing to think about is, uh, you know, um, what, would there be a European word at all? Would there be a word for the quote unquote non native, which is where they are presumably at this point of time? Uh, would they have served English breakfast? So, would they have proper English breakfast? Or would they have chapati, which is, uh, you know, flat bread and made in Indian style, which is something they resent, presumably? Right. So, the whole idea of Anglo Indians become important. I'll stop at this point today, but just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the Anglo Indians. Now, obviously, Anglo Indians were uh, products, the generations which emerge out of miscegenation out of quote-unquote, you know, sometimes legitimate, sometimes illegitimate uh, uh, affairs between Englishmen and native women. So they were the mixed breed, they were the hybrid breed uh, out of colonialism. Uh, but interestingly, we find that Anglo-Indians, uh, you know, they were the ones who get uh, doubly discriminated at all points of time because the English don't want to own them, they disown them uh, because they are more often than not illegitimate offsprings of affairs between Englishmen and native women. And Indians post independence also treat them badly because they remain as a remnant of the white sahib, uh, the remnant of the white man, and which, who is now powerless, who is now agency less. So now it's a good time to attack him. So the Anglo Indians are very anxious presence apropos of partition and post partition. And obviously, we find that the entire anxiety is couched over here uh, through some very deliberately flippant uh, rhetorics and very deliberately flippant vocabulary, such as, for instance, they're talking about how uh, they will get actual good breads or would they, be, uh, would they have to suffer uh, bloody Indian chapati, as I mentioned. Right. Uh, so, you know, chapati, bread, uh, the, the absence of the European word, all these become very symbolic uh, anxiety. So, will there be European word at all now that English are leaving? Or would they have to sleep with in the same bed, in the same series of bed with the natives? So there's obviously going to be a change in everything, and that's something which they're obsessed with. And then the final question, obviously, here is: Would they be served English breakfast, which is something they hitherto had, or will they be subjected to the Indian bread or the chapati instead of the English bread? So I'll stop at this point today, and we'll see again just very quickly um, uh, recapitulate and, and summarize again for you. Uh, this entire story about irrationality and, and madness inside the madhouse, uh, the questions which are asked among the madmen to each other are very irrational questions, are very absurd questions, are very sometimes funny questions. But the funniness, absurdity and the irrationality of these questions are precisely and deliberately done and dramatized so as to question the, uh, the absurd quality of partition in the first place, you know, because absurdity comes out of absurdity in the story. The more absurd the partition there was historically, the more so the questions are over here as well. So from the next class, we'll see how the character, the main protagonist in the story, is described in great details, and how it becomes a symbol of unflowing time, of frozen time, which is sort of almost anatomically and bodily represented 
in his being, the fact that time doesn't flow anymore. And he remembers something many, many, many years ago when you know, everyone was different. He had a very small child. However, he finds it difficult to remember something which happened to him recently. And that, that character, uh, Bishan Singh, uh, is a really moving character in, in partition fiction. And he's someone who will, st who will take up in the next lecture. But suffice it to say, this story at this point, till this point, we'll see how this, this question of agency-lessness begins to come in. And this madman became, uh, you know, agency-less in a very, very literal sense, right? So they're madmen, they're doubly marginalized inside a Lahore asylum. And again, this Lahore and Ritsa uh, locations are very important because, like you said, the geopolitical reclassification is um, interesting because that so also means, also entails that a reclassified thoughts occurs in the mind, uh, which is obviously a violent process of forgetting, of, you know, de-narrativizing something. You get out of a narrative, you, you go and join some of the narrative. And the entire process takes place with disruption and defamiliarization, which is something which we'll talk about in more details in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.